Yesterday we talked about the WWDC, and this year I want to talk about the year of Apple innovation, so even before WWDC, because since we didn't have um, um, Objective Cologne last year, and, and even last SwiftConf, um, we have a few uh, things to catch up. So I'm going to call back the speakers of today, and I'm going to start with Uli Kusner, just before, just, 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 just when, you, when you sit down. I, I swear I didn't make that on purpose, but it, it was just on the starting block for, the, for like the last 10 minutes, and then when he sits down. All right, and so the next one will be Scott Little. See how you appear? I think I have to remake. I, I will redo that transition so that you watch at the transition. You are like <sighs> appearing. No flames? No, no flames. That's when you leave. That's why. <laughs> I, did, I, was, I wasn't about to burn you, so Do no we have things. enough for everyone today? Number three. Uh, <laughs> Philip. Yay. <laughs> you know what? I actually, I didn't mean that, but uh, if you want to join, you were a speaker today as well. So, uh, Whatever. If you feel like there is something interesting you have to say after a while. Just yell. Just or just yell. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, uh, we don't want to forget the, um, the the lit speaker this year as well. It's becoming late for me. Uh, so let's come back. Let's welcome back Dell. <laughs> <laughs> we might call you after a while, you know, Lex, or or if if, the, if we have some kind of. Historical, technical, Google question. We might call Wolf even to the rescue. Yeah, yeah. that is an auction house. Like, what are we gonna sell? Um, <laughs> and as far as I remember, I think they actually sold like auction house. Like they actually sold like meat here. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Exactly. Like, how much? Like, all right. And the next one, let's welcome back Clément Sauvage. Uh, who was, who was uh, well, we should have started with a show of hand of who has an, uh, an Apple Watch, first of all, but I think you asked that already, so who has an Apple Watch? Ooh. It's actually, that's not so many people as I thought. Uh, but from all of those guys, who had a watch before? Who was wearing a watch before? Who was wearing a watch before? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay, that's, that's a pretty much like the half of it, like right? Like even probably 40 percent. I'm, I'm one of those. So I guess this is kind of my first question. It's like, uh, how does Apple make it? And, and what's the, like, the added benefit? I kind of know the answer, but it, I think it's really interesting. Um, I don't really consider this as a watch, obviously, but more uh, my, my, uh, my kids are saying, oh, this is like a little iPhone on your wrist. And I really think it is. So what's the, what's the secret sauce that made <coughs> Apple wear us? Actually, to be honest with you, one of the reasons I don't wear a watch, I guess it's Mostly the reason for a lot of people is because I'm, I find it pretty inconvenient to have something on my wrist. I don't really like this thing on my wrist. Uh, but yeah, I, I went the crazy path of having something on my wrist. Um, so why do you think it's... Um, and by the way, you don't, have a, you don't have an Apple Watch, but you have a um, yeah, Pebble. Yeah, I have a Pebble, so I know yeah. why yeah. I would so I start. Or yeah, you can start if you want. Did you, um, have, did you have a watch before you have a pebble? Because for me, it's the same problem. Yes and no, I had a pocket watch. Uh, a pocket watch? Yes. Did you also have a monocle? Is that an no, iPhone? No, no. But, but the pocket watch had a chain that attached it. So. Oh, really? That's very noble. <laughs> <laughs> you can get that for Apple Watch too, you know? That's yeah, yeah. Chain. Yeah, go ahead. But the Apple Watch isn't wind up, so... I, nah. <laughs> <laughs> too mainstream. Yeah. yeah go so ahead. Um, yeah, since I've been using Pebble for a while longer than you, people had the chance to use an Apple Watch. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, yeah, I, I just got it. Well, one of the things was I uh, used to bike to work at the time, and it was just nice that if you had your phone ringing in your pocket, you could just look a quick glance on it. Is it something, someone important? Do I have to stop, or can I just keep driving and let them go to mailbox? Um, so that was kind of the, the first reason I wanted this thing for. And um, uh, yeah, and I think in general, if you have, and I know that's not all of us, um, a, a need for um, having certain notifications um, shown to you quickly, um, 
I think that's like one of the main things that, that I like a watch for. Um, and the second thing that I didn't expect that I'd like so much is the alarm function on the watch. Because uh, oddly, yeah, that, that seems crazy, right? Um, because, uh, for example, I go, I get on a train or something and I'm tired and um, I've never ridden this line before, but I know I will arrive at five or something. So I just quickly set up an alarm to 10 to five and go to sleep. And I can actually sleep on the train because I know this thing will wake me up. And even more, since most of them, the Apple Watch taps you or this one has a vibration alarm, um, you actually, like you sit there and it just wakes you up. It doesn't beep, beep, beep the whole room awake, you know, so you don't get the angry stares either. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. And it's just uh, the, the whole, you know, like you get a text message and you quickly say like, oh yeah, um, I can't talk right now. Um, <laughs> whatever answers you give. Um, uh, I don't know, I find that useful. It's, it's still a luxury item, um, but I don't know. I, I, I see no reason why you wouldn't want it. Uh, for me, this is actually the office watch. So we bought one for the office and we're passing it around so we can test it and stuff. I had it for a week uh, when it arrived and actually wrote a blog post saying why I didn't like it. <laughs> uh, and now I'm back on it because I figured I'm going to travel for a week and see if, if it changes anything and my, my feelings for it. And so far, it's better than I wrote in my post, but it's still not quite to the point where it warrants the amount of maintenance that it needs for me, uh, charging it every night, and uh, the fact that you have something else on your wrist that you have to think about. Um, and I don't like the fact that to track exercise, you have to tell it to track exercise. In my opinion, it should have enough smarts, and hopefully in WatchOS 2 has that, have enough smarts to figure out, yes, you are biking, yes, you are running, given the, the vibration movements that are happening, that they should just track that. And when I tell it on biking, and then it says, well, you biked for four minutes. No, it was like an hour. <laughs> so it still needs some calibration, I guess. So that's why I'm, I'm not so hot on the watch right now, but I'm, uh, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to buy a V1 so far, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reevaluate it when V2 comes out. Whenever that is. Whenever that is. Uh, I, I don't have one. I don't wear a watch. I used to wear a watch up until about 2008 uh, when I got my first iPhone. I stopped wearing my watch. Um, mostly because I actually also got a, a newer MacBook Pro, which uh, has, as these do, the, f the front part which in steel. And I had a steel banded watch, and I hated it scraping against the, the computer. Whether or not it was actually doing damage, it annoyed the crap out of me. The good thing with the Apple Watch is you cannot afford the steel one. Yeah, well, there's the, there is that. And so it might be interesting to try with the new bands, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not in any hurry to buy the new watch. Uh, I. I personally don't get a whole lot of notifications. I can tell you with this band, uh, the fluorelastomer one, I had the same concerns. My Pebble does the exa exact same thing, and with this, it's no problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, was looking at, I was looking at Uli's thinking that that one would do the same thing, and I would be annoyed by it because it has that metal band. You can always change bands, but um, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, uh, I don't get a lot of notifications, so that's not an advantage for me to do a lot of triage on notifications. Um, so that's not a big selling point. I guess having the time on my wrist is always nice. I used that a lot when I used a watch. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think I would, you know, I, I think the, the biggest factor uh, for me as a selling point is, uh, is the exercise and stuff like that. But, you know, you hear conflicting reports about that. Some people love it. Some people they say it's a bit of a pain, whatever. So. I just, does drop it? Uh, will you say that I will to uh, take two points here. Uh, Uli said that uh, we have notification that's cool, especially when uh, you give some courses, you give conference, you have a call, just uh, see what, it, what message is it, and you don't have to take out your iPhone from the pocket, that's cool. That's cool in a second situation when you are uh, on uh, the um, s subway, when, <coughs> when, you, when there's strange people on it, you don't have to take your beautiful iPhone 6 or iPhone 6 Plus, out of your pocket, selling, showing everybody that you have money to buy this kind of stuff. You just look, a, take a blink to the, your to your phone, and then that's pretty cool. The second thing is about uh, activity. There's okay, it tracks activity, but uh, Apple made a lot of papers. Uh, invite the what, what were those that the girl on the keynote doesn't matter. <coughs> 
Yep, but uh, there's some Jobuns, Tracker, there's Misfit, who does the job better than the, does the Apple Watch. Even the Apple Watch is not submersible. It's a bit shame, I think. It should be. It's not what? Submersible. submersible. Oh, yeah, well, it is kind of, but uh, like one meter and 30 minutes. It's not guaranteed to be submersible. Yeah, well, it's but not it like the pebble. Like, uh, <laughs> I forgot to mention, I, I have a pebble time. Some of you have seen that, uh, I think, on, on Monday. Um, so I, I, I bought the pebble time, and, and, and one of the good things about the pebble time is it had 30 meters um, uh, submersible. Uh, so, um, but but I, I still, I still, we had a discussion about that on Twitter that you said you, you, you kind of hate the fact that you have to uh, move your wrist. Was it you? Right? Yeah, yeah. But, but I, I, for me, it doesn't work because uh, apparently, like the, the way in which I move my arm, it's. Um, you're moving it wrong. That's the yeah, problem. You're moving, moving it wrong. Moving <laughs> it wrong. Yeah, that's you're moving it wrong. It. So, so it, it, and also, usually I wear long sleeves, like, you know, that shirt here. Um, and uh, by the time I have, uh, I've moved back my sleeve, the, the Apple Watch has already turned off. So that didn't really work out for me. But I, actually, since I'm just grab the microphone again. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to mention, yeah, the, the, the uh, step counting is also something I use a lot, which I find really nice. That it's, you know, I'm not a sports nut or anything, but it really tricks you into, um, you know, you just look at it and you see like this circle is like three quarters full or something and you go, okay, I'll take another walk to the grocery store so it's full or something. It's just small things or, uh, yeah, whatever. So it, it's just nice to have that in the in the back of your head to kind of make sure that you don't become a, a couch potato totally, which in our line of work is something that happens easily. And also what I um, use it for a lot um, is you have the, um, the audio controls. Yeah. And that's really useful, especially like in winter um, when you know you're all packed up and your phone is like in your chest pocket and when you take out your phone it cools down too much and will just stop working and the touch screen won't work or whatever. You have to hold, turn, uh, you know. I don't know how that will be with the Apple Watch because that's a touch screen too so that will probably not work. But I, mean, I the use Pebble the Apple Watch a lot for, for posing podcasts or rewinding podcasts. Mm. Yeah. Um, and never for skipping ads, well. never. Um, and <laughs> and um, <laughs> so uh, no, I, I was going to say I, I, I don't Want this to, to start kind of, to start kind of a religion war between religion war between the, the Pebble and the, um, and the Apple Watch. But what I found out during the Pebble, <laughs> yeah, is yeah. Um, is that um, I could totally see how the Pebble was awesome before the Apple Watch. But since I have an Apple Watch, the, the, the Pebble is so much to the Apple Watch <laughs> as a, a calculator is to my my MacBook. Because uh, well, yeah, d definitely. That's like not gonna start a war. <laughs> no. Not what if I want to? <laughs> this is a nice one. <laughs> No, it's, uh, what, what I really like about the Apple Watch is just the controls, just that you can use the touch screen, like having to push a button to go up or down or something. But I mean, that's you know, like general phone usability and, and, or, or device. It's not really something that decides whether you'd want to watch or not. So, and I think the features that you would want or not want to watch for are roughly the same across the Apple Watch and the Pebble. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, Pebble may have a different use case than Apple Watch has because effectively Apple Watch is a completely multifunctional device. So you could use it for many different things, but essentially I, the view I have is a watch is a fashion accessory. So for me, I use I used a watch for quite a long time. Uh, I don't have Apple Watch yet, but I know that I would probably put it off the moment I get home. So it really limits the use cases that I have for that's Apple Watch. That's interesting because that's the other way around. Since I have my Apple Watch, I'm putting my phone some, somewhere in the kitchen or whatever, and I just I do that too. I put it on my high-rise stand. I can see the notifications from there. I want to get rid of this something that's on my wrist, and I can't really use it for sports because it involves what I do, a lot of okay. touching and grabbing of hands, and it would just get broken and, or ripped off. So, so it's interesting because you said th these are two different people, and this is really uh, what I exactly. see. Like, um, um, who has anybody uh, uh, here a pebble? Is anybody we wearing a pebble or having a pebble? Um, so you have a pebble as well. What I found out is I really think that the pebble is really for nerds, geeks, uh, like normal people don't have a pebble, uh, and uh, even though they s they sold a lot of it, and and the Apple Watch is more for normal people, and this is why it's a good segue to my next term which is kind of the mode or the f fashion. Actually, the word should be fashion. 
I guess, the fashion effect of, of the watch. I have, a, I have kind of a segue as well. It's, um, when I saw the Apple Watch and what it could do, um, one of the things that came to mind is uh, uh, my mom is uh, 70, uh, 75, and um, she's, she's got difficulty walking, and she fell in the house once, and the, basically she was able to crawl to a phone to be able to call someone. If she had a cell phone, like she doesn't have, she have a cell phone that she turns off all the time. So if I could get her to use an iPhone, like keeping it charged and everything and bringing it with her and getting her calls on the, on the iPhone as opposed to a landline and then getting the watch, because in the house it's a whole Wi-Fi network so she could connect with it. And she could just get into the habit of just wearing a watch. She, she's worn a watch before, that's not a problem. But uh, she has to wear the watch and then keep on using it and then getting uh, the time, but also getting her heart rate and getting the phone on the watch and being able to call at any place, that would be a really good use case. Unfortunately, my mom is also kind of cheap, <laughs> so you know you have to buy an iPhone 6 Plus and because uh, you know she's elderly, so she needs a big phone um, and um, uh, and an Apple Watch. And you're, you're getting close into the you know $1,200 plus all the fees. It's like <coughs> she she doesn't want that, but if she could get that, it sounds like a potentially useful use case. It's a really interesting one, yeah. Um, so yeah, again, I want to get back on this this, this fashion thing because uh, obviously lots of bands, very expensive bands. My my mother-in-law, by the way, was telling me uh, last weekend um, she had uh, potentially would have potentially buy uh, bought a bought a watch, but the watch she wanted was at uh, the price was actually one thousand one hundred euro. So at first you're like, what? What kind of watch? And this is pretty simple. It's just like the you know the you know the the middle uh, one. Um, so not. No, no, no. But not not only um, not only that it's uh, the stainless steel, but it's also the um, the one with the metal um, arm. Milanese? Not the Milanese, but the other one. The, Milanese no, the metal arm, the metal band. Yeah, the metal band, the real metal band. The Milanese is actually 650 euro. But if you want the metal band, the actual metal band, they only sell it with uh, the with the stainless steel. If you want, you can buy a non-stainless steel, uh, so an aluminium, and and get the the extra band, and so you save about 200 euro. Uh, but but then again, uh, and and somebody was telling me, I think Lex was telling me that uh, this metal band is actually working pretty well with uh, uh, with with the aluminium. Um, somebody has that. Who who was that? Oh yeah, Rene Ritchie from iMore. He has this combination. Apparently it works. Uh, but still, that's that's a lot of money. And so yeah, uh, so my point is, this is the first. I think this is the real, really the first product from Apple, which is. Um, as much of a fashion product as, as is it a technological project. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was gonna, the, 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 the iPad minis were fashion, fashion objects. I mean, really? Yeah, I they, were the, so. they were, I mean, they weren't the first, but they were, the, uh, think about the advertisements for iPad, think about the colors they put, um, iPods, put, think about the colors they put on those iPods and all that kind of stuff. I think those were, those were also, not, you're right, not quite as much. Yeah as the watch, but yeah, this one is way more fashion. Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, well, I would like to extend this discussion into whether you guys think that Apple Watch would change the classic watch industry. Because for example, right now, you can buy a really expensive watch, like a classical watch from either Rolex, Dach Heuer, whatever. It's gonna cost you maybe 1,000 euros. But now you buy an Apple Watch, and if you want to get the same kind of materials, you would effectively pay close to a thousand euros as well. But the problem that I see here is that it's going to get old really fast if they ship new hardware. So what do you guys think would that mean for the whole industry of classic watches? The, the next couple of years are going to be very interesting because I, I have uh, a Rolex and I, that I don't have right now, but uh, that I intend eventually to pass on to my children or my grandchildren and hopefully they'll look at this and they'll say, this is, a, this is something that's nice and beautiful and we can, it's, there's gonna be an heirloom. And I'm pretty sure, given the way technology is going, that in a couple I, of years, I an Apple Watch is gonna be, hey, it's a piece of junk, you know? Yeah, I kind of doubt. Uh, but it's a very interesting question because uh, um, yeah, I, I think it's going to change the industry uh, in like really big times because uh, obviously at one point many people are, are not really willing to wear something on their wrist which is just a stupid watch. They want this thing to do something more than just being a watch. There's this uh, XKC, XKCD cartoon, I can't remember the number off the top of my hand, where <laughs> basically there's a timeline and then it said, you know, before, from, uh, before uh, 2004 or something and then 
2004 to 2015 is the glorious time where we had nothing on our wrists. <laughs> so, because <laughs> beforehand, man, people used to wear, uh, uh, you know, wristwatches all the time. So, and, and, and that's the thing that I was uh, just um, saying that I'm leaving my phone, um, so I don't, I use my phone less. But the other thing which is really interesting is that I finally, finally look at what time it is on my wrist, uh, because I haven't done that for a while, uh, for 20 years. And I know this is very, this sounds very stupid. And the reason you were doing that, if it's, if you're anything like me, is that you realize at some point, I wear a watch, but the time is freaking everywhere, on my computer, on my phone, every display On my has phone, it. yeah. So why would I wear a thing that I have to put batteries, recharge, whatever, keep the time on, when I don't have to? That's kind of but where the, I the watch The problem with the, the phone, and then I'll let you speak, uh, um, Scott, the problem with the phone, uh, look, stupidly looking at what time is it, is that you realize, oh, I have a notification from Facebook, so okay. I'm gonna read it. And before you, before you, you know it, you, you've been like, well, the last half hour you've been on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, the good thing about the watch, you look at the weather, uh, uh, like at the, at the time, and this could change, by the way, with complications. But you look at the time, and then you just look at the time, and this red dot, you might totally just ignore it, and then that's it. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, there, there's a couple of things. And I, you know, um, my use case is, I think, maybe different than a lot of people. Uh, I spend most of my time sitting at home, uh, sitting, in, sitting at my desk, working like that. You know, I'm talking about a lot of people in the world, not a lot of people in this room. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my phone is usually in my pocket even when I'm sitting down. So I, I can usually see the time on my computer. But anywhere else I go in my house, I don't know about you, I don't see the time everywhere. I have no clocks in my house. Uh, the one on our stove recently stopped working, so I, there I came. I'm always like, what so, the fuck time is it? <laughs> that's a, so that's a good present idea for you. If anybody has to offer something to uh, Scott, so clock. I don't know. I mean, yes and no. I think a lot of people like like being able to look at the time on their wrist. I think if I can answer the the question you just posed is when would you want, um, you know, like uh, the why would you want to watch anyway, and that. Um, uh, I think the the reason mainly is if you're occupied in some way, and I think that's kind of why they picked Christy Turlington, who was running a marathon, because you've seen joggers, maybe you've been even one who had like this huge iPhone six strapped to oh, their yeah. upper, upper arm, and like every every kilometer they go like. Shook. Even worse, people are working with their phone in the hand. Yes. Yeah, I that's see that true, all the yeah. time. And. Um, Instead, if you have this thing, you can leave, you know, if you're at the, at the gym or something, you can just leave it in your bag, your phone. Nobody even has to know that you have one with you. Um, if you're go out running or something, you can put it like in a fanny pack or something and it's hidden away as well, not in the way. And, you know, like those packs stay in their place better than this thing that you wrap around your arm, even if you have the most uh, uh, modeled, chiseled arms. To, to answer your question uh, about the fashion effect, I think it's undoubtedly the most fashion-like thing that Apple has ever done. And it, the proof is in the fact that they hired people from the fashion industry oh, yeah. to run all of that. Uh, somebody from Cartier or, or, or Yves Saint Laurent, I, don't, I forget. Yves Saint Laurent. Yves Saint and of course, Angela Irons, uh, which we have yet to see on stage. Uh, but she's in charge of, of uh, Apple stores, but certainly she has a, she's, the main involvement there is, in, is how do we display the watch and stuff. So. Um, so that's the proof is in that pudding for me. There's if, you, if you have a question, wave at me, right? The um, the fashion effect. I think the fashion effect is a bit devalued by uh, the. I think the planned obsolescence. You know the planned obsolescence. I don't know obsolescence program in French. Planned obsolescence. Yes. Planned plan obsolescence. obsolescence. <coughs> well, I think we have my, two guys speaking French. We've <laughs> by we've by okay. Well, this one, I don't know who, where, which one, which one you are you wearing, but basic one. I, I wear the um, the one in stainless, stainless with uh, I bought originally the leather the leather wrist. It cost no no maybe seven ninety nine. <coughs> I wear the one for people not going uh, at the intercontinental. <laughs> and no, no the, the, um, and uh, about about uh, to about the fact that uh, the the fashion effect of the watch in France, you have to know that the only store who sell the watch is a fashion store, it's Colette, which is a, which is a concept store, which is absolutely awesome. I didn't know this, uh, this, uh, this shop before, but I went here to buy my Apple Watch. It's quite cool, and they made all for Apple Watch. That's really awesome. But the thing that plan obsolescence of the watch devaluated a little bit the fact of the fashion effect, because we all use iPhone since, I would say dozen, but 
half a dozen of year, and we know that each iPhone. year we buy an iPhone. I have an iPhone 5. <laughs> <coughs> I have a 5S. Yeah. So, so I'm not so much into those big iPhones that nobody can care. I don't know. The fact that technology goes with the time, so. So um, we're going to switch gears. Um, um, yeah, I want to say something on that, but you want to add something? That's okay, go ahead. Um, I had one right. thing to add, just uh, why are we su assuming that it's planned obsolescence? Well, yeah, I was um, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. That's why I mean, on one hand, you know, I wouldn't put it past Apple to just say, well, they have the money, we can do it. But uh, I think, you know, given especially the, the initial release of the Apple Watch, which was more as a separate screen for the iPhone and very dependent on the screen, which has changed a little now, I, I would totally, uh, could totally see them making that more, you know, like the Mac Mini, which is like a machine that is there but gets updated a lot more, a lot less. Or the uh, Apple TV. Yeah, or the, yeah, the Apple TV is probably a better example, or even the, the iPod uh, uh, Touch, yeah. that they just go and say, okay, this is the level at which the watch will be. When the hardware manufacturer doesn't make those parts anymore, we'll do a small bump of the, of the device maybe. But in general, it'll stay this device, and your phone will carry the the load, mm. and so um, it'll essentially be a thin client or something. And then it doesn't matter that the technology is generations old, and maybe you'll get more battery time over time. But that's it. And actually, the, um, what we tend to forget is that the phone is actually based on a two years contract in most countries. Um, the iPad is not, and that's why most people keep their iPad for at least three years, if not four, if not sometime crazy five. And I think the watch might not be, people might not change the watch every year or two years. People might keep the watch for four years. Yeah, and I also think you need to think about what Apple says and emphasizes quite a lot is that this is the most personal device that they've ever made. Intimate. They say intimate. Intimate and personal. I, I and feel a little bit uncomfortable when they say, like, this is an intimate device. Well, I, I think that their fo they focus on, on is it. that it's intimate for, you, for the person and physically and stuff like that. But the point is that it's a very per even more personal than a phone. They already sell a buttload of film, uh, phones. Um, they, I, think they, I think they, you know, long-term-wise, they see a, a much larger uh, uh, potential customer base for for a watch because more people might be interested in having a watch even than a phone and they may eventually get to the point where you don't need a phone as well so I think that I don't think it's planned obsolescence I think they're planning on people holding on to an a, a watch much longer even than a phone and I think there they they plan people to have it for at least two years if not longer so I don't know so I wanted to change gears and go to <coughs> This guy over here, because uh, this is new from this year also, the 12-inch MacBook, obviously gold. Is that an iPad or? <laughs> That's as small as an iPad, which is Gold is best. Rafi says. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, um, this is also something new from this year, and um, it's really as thin as an iPad. But then what's interesting is that we discussed yesterday about the iPad becoming a desktop, uh, but this is more. We one could think that this is more a device targeted at developers, but obviously it's not really because we don't have yet the cable for um, running Xcode on it uh, with the, the iPhone, and unless you are doing the the adapter chain. Um, so and 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 it has also only one port. Which, uh, to be honest with you, I totally I I'm cool with one port. I don't know you, Uli, but I really. Yeah, I don't um, have a problem with the one port thing. Way, way less yeah. than I anticipated. Yeah, it's especially, you know, given if, if you look at what Apple has been doing with the Thunderbolt display, which is that there's essentially one wire coming out um, that you plug into your laptop and then everything is docked there. And while you, you know, this is a machine that's intended to be easy to carry. And so I totally understand that, you know, usually when you're on the road, all you want to do is maybe plug in power to charge it sometimes. And I have to say, it's um, with, I mean, if I was compiling a lot, it was different. But um, otherwise, this batter will keep me a day. So yeah. um, that's good enough. And um, <coughs> that usually means I just, you know, pack it in my bag and use it and don't even think about it. And I don't need to plug anything into it. And in the situations where at least I, and I mean, we work with hardware, 
um, need to plug in that device. It's usually in an office setting or something where whatever devi device I plug in would be hanging off the, the thing anyway. So the, the only moments where I could see it being a problem is like when you have a USB stick or something, but they'll make USB-C sticks. and well, they you, do it already. You can yeah. use that port for that. The um, dual ones even? Yeah, well, dual ones right now, not, not pure yeah. ones yet, yeah. So that you can communicate with another yeah. one. But I'm just saying, like, why would you, like, in most cases, I don't see why you would need more ports. 640K is enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. a second, uh, I'm okay for a second port. In, 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 in my case, the, the one port tells me that this is not suitable to be my only machine. Um, it's not a machine for me because I'm a developer. I carry my 15-inch around. Maybe if the 13-inch had four cores, I would use that better because I like a laptop that I can carry. But Basically, the only time I would use a machine like this would be if I had, say, a Mac Pro at home as my main station, and this would be my thing on the road or something. That would be uh, perfectly, uh, you know, suitable. But uh, I went shopping for a MacBook Air with my daughter, or for for a laptop with my daughter, and she had my old MacBook Air, and she put her earbuds between the keyboard and the screen and closed the screen. Oh, I can see people <laughs> realizing what happened. So there's a nice spider crack on the screen, and it's spread out in a colorful fashion. Um, so we looked at all of those. She looked at this one because she's, she's in fashion, so she's very, very attuned to all the things that, and she wants something lightweight. And she ended up from moving from her 13-inch, my old 13-inch MacBook Air, to 11-inch MacBook Air, because even though it doesn't have a retina display, and she acknowledges that the display is not as nice, and it's slightly heavier. It's got two USB ports, so she can plug in her graphics tablet, she can plug in her, uh, uh, her camera to for the pictures that she takes, she can plug in her phone to charge it and stuff like that. And uh, having the one port for her was the total deal killer. She could adapt to the keyboard, uh, and I can see why it's done that way, but definitely it's, it's a machine for carrying around and doing light tasks. And it's very akin to the very first uh, MacBook Air, which was an incredibly slow and underpowered. And I had a, some, somebody at Corel when I worked that bought this as a project manager, and he mm. said, it's wonderful because it's so lightweight, you can carry it around. Yes, but can you do anything on it? Ah, it's kind of slow. <laughs> so the, the only thing is this is not 4,200 RPM hard drive. So but this is not underpowered, slow. by the way. Uh, compared to the original MacBook Air. Um, True, but compared to the, how about, how about compared to the current MacBook Air? How? Well, yeah, then it is underpowered. That's kind of what I mean, right? I it's guess. more expensive and underpowered for that. So. Well, considering uh, that you already have a retina display, and that's a lot of pixels I'll, to I'll, push. I'll, well, yeah, but I wouldn't it's say also it's the, the, only re the, the main reason why I wouldn't have a MacBook Air instead. And I had an 11-inch before, and you also had an 11-inch before, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the the retina one, thing, like, I don't, I, if I look at a non-retina display, I get eye cancer, basically. Um, I, I die. Liar. Yeah. yeah. Um, Literally get Philip? eye cancer. <laughs> Phil, well, okay, I, I was kind of wondering, uh, does your daughter use the, de the, the MacBook like mostly at home or like, like you know, because she plugs her tablet in? So that's a good question. She, she, go, she carries the school or to a, any event she goes to. Uh, so the 13 inch was really handy for that. She called it her BFF. So, um, uh, and she's got stickers on and everything. But uh, at home, it's closed and plugged into a screen with the tablet. So it's kind of a hub. So it doesn't matter that the 11 inch screen is so small. She could totally adapt that to that on the road. It was more of a, when I have this, I have all my stuff, right? It's all in there. If I had this and a Mac Pro, I would never have all my stuff in the same place, right? Which is kind of handy when you want to do, you, can always you just want to carry your, your house with you. Yeah, uh, I have a question for you, Stuff. You said you thought that this 12 inch was <laughs> made for developers? No, 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 no. I said it, I, I don't think it is made for developers, okay, okay. but you can develop on it, really. I'm not even kidding. You can really run yeah, Xcode. Yeah, I'm sure you can. I, but well, I thought that's what you said, and I was going to no, no, take no, issue the reason, with that. But the main reason why I said I don't think it is made for, developer, made for developers is they don't even have that cable yet, which is kind of a sign. Uh, but you can totally, but my, so my main machine is, a, is, is this 15-inch MacBook Pro, um, um, but um, Retina MacBook Pro, uh, but, but this is what I carry around when I go to conferences, when I do uh, lots of stuff where I have to write down on with, with a bunch of other people because having a 15-inch uh, computer is in a lot of situations very, not very so social. Um, I, I mean, I'm coming back from a 17-inch uh, a few years ago, so <laughs> this was really uh, weird. And, and again, and this is, this guy is, I mean, the question about the iPad is like kind of questionable. This is as, almost as thin as an iPad. It's thinner than any com keyboard. Is that, is, that, is that an iPad 4? Um, that's an iPad Air 2. Uh, that's an iPad Air 2. Um, um, 
right? Yeah, and the other thing, which right. really I think in terms of innovation is really interesting, is the butterfly keyboard. I like the name, first of Disgusted. all. Disgusted. Uh, I, I tried it, I don't like well, that at all. You get used to it, really. And once you're used to it, you realize you type on this guy faster than on any other keyboard. Yeah. Really? Go ahead, enter my password. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you get used to it, I mean, um, and after a while you realize this is probably the, it's the <coughs> way we're going anyways, right? There, this is the beginning, and at one point every laptop in the industry are gonna have a butterfly keyboard. So I, I, used, I used to use uh, with my 15-inch uh, MacBook Pro an external display at, uh, at office and at home with an external keyboard. And I think myself that I touched on the keyboard a bit to strength. So I, w I would be fear to broke the keyboard here. Oh, there's no way you can broke that guy. But the, the sure thing is you, it, feels like <coughs> it feels a little bit cheap at the beginning. It you don't have any feedback, obviously. But that makes that my impression is that I'm fi typing faster because basically from the moment I type the key, the, the key is typed, that's it. I'm going to the next key. Um. Yeah, I've also, I, I think it's, you know, like, I'm not really known for having like uh, very good motor control or anything like that. You know, I'm not a ballet person or anything like that by any stretch of the word. And um, I just, um, uh, we've all read, uh, read articles, I don't have to name names from people who say, oh, this keyboard is so unusable and, and it hurts my fingers when I type on it and things like that. And I'm just saying, you know, like if you don't have that fine motor control that you can stop your finger, on, on such a button, then uh, maybe you should go see a doctor. Okay, now I'm being me. But you know, I, I think if I can manage it, probably most people can manage it. So I think this keyboard is not a problem. It, it you maybe takes you a week of typing on it to get used to it. I, um, with people who type a little more, it should probably go faster. I, I have a question for the audience. So um, how long do you think it's gonna take for the bottom part of this MacBook to be essentially an iPad? So uh, a keyboard that's completely, it's just a glass surface that's got an integrated trackpad, it's got a keyboard, it's got, you know, it, that's a very there's no tac there, there's, there's tactile feedback using the force touch like we have in a trackpad, but nothing moves. How long do you think that's going to take for, for that to happen? So while I'm reaching, um, Michael, um, <coughs> it's really interesting. When I gave my, um, my wife for the first time uh, this computer to type on it, what she actually said, said to me, this thing on, um, was um, because she, she doesn't know, she, she was like, so is this Apple's way of introducing us to the full uh, software keyboards? Um, because it really feels like you are typing directly on the, and I really think you are right. It, it, I, I, I and, think and you, say, you said yourself, it took you about a week to get used to it. How long did it take you to get used to typing on the iPad, like long form and stuff like that? Federico Vitici uses an iPad to do all his stuff, including long form writing, and he writes a lot. So it is possible, but you got used to it in a week. Maybe in another week, if this was a completely glass trackpad, you would just get used to it. With force feedback, mind you, that's kind of yeah, the key. Yeah, that, well, that's the point. So force feedback is very important. I think that's, that's the thing. It's like, so, um, like hardware keyboard, and then it's your time, um, Michael. Yeah, he has the mic already. Uh, or somebody else? No, he has the mic already. Um, hardware, um, hardware keyboards have no future. It, maybe it's, maybe they are, they are still for another, whatever, five, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. At one point, I think this will be like a double thing with force touch. But, and you know, Apple has always, or it's not Apple, somebody has a technology which actually uh, makes the, the screen popping out. So they could, they could uh, th in theory, and not in theory, they have already working prototypes, they could make the keys uh, pop out of the screen. And you could even have <coughs> a, an API in UI kit in five years that says, okay, I, I, this, uh, this uh, shape or whatever, um, make it pop out. Um, the, re the reason the iPad is so solid though is because it's a unified surface, so. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so yeah, uh, I think the actual problem with replacing the keyboard with a pure, like, uh, haptic, taptic engine, um, uh, forced feedback um, uh, keyboard uh, at the moment is that with the trackpad, the whole trackpad has the taptic or, or the, the haptic engine. Um, so they would either, for this to work, make each key a single haptic engine uh, feedback, and that's something I could totally imagine. Um, or they need to have some technique that Stuff mentioned where 
the a single part of the the um, keyboard comes up or something like. Let that. me put it this way then. For the Taptic engine, the, like on the watch, there's only a few elements that make it force feedback. But for um, the trackpad, there's a bit more. And what if it was was a grid underneath, kind of like pixels, but for feeling? So you could program it any way you want, and you can make them send. Like it's not like an on-off. It's actually a um, a pulse with a, a more or less voltage. So you could modulate it. So even though your four uh, engines are there, and you the, and your key is supposed to be there. You can modulate all these forces. So you can feel that it's there. Imagine that exists. Yeah, but still, I would I would assume that you still, if you like, lay all your hands down on the keyboard, you would still feel that something's going on with, on the other fingers. And I think that's not g going to work pretty well for a keyboard. But I think they will introduce this keyboard down the line, like next thing is probably the usual MacBook Pros getting this keyboard. Uh, and once they've done this, um, I do think that's the next step they are, that, that, that they are going to do. Well, do, do any of you like have actual knowledge about how this uh, Taptic engine, like the basic principle, how that works or something? Or is that just, just speculation it's, right it's now? It's like a vibrator, right? It's like, it side -side. yeah, but I mean like side side by side. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, like, is there something like triangulating between several of those, to, or is that just no, something no? No, currently, okay, currently, yeah. it's the whole, it's the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. But when you move your, when you move your finger on it, depending on where you are, when you click or you force click, you feel it there. You don't, you don't feel it somewhere else. So yeah, it is modulating. That's because that's because that's where your finger is. If you have a second finger, you also feel a difference. But anyway, yeah. Well, that's because, if you have you done it with two fingers and you feel it on one and not the other. No, no you true. feel it on both. Well, both of them are touching that all thing the is glass what, moves. That thing is a, like an illusion. It's a trick. Yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. It tricks exactly. your mind. Yeah, I yeah. agree. And, and on, on, that, on that note, this is probably one of the most <laughs> impressive stuff in, the, in this guy. When you turn it off, uh, off, you can't click anymore. And so you're like totally, it's, it's, you're really like wondering, wait, I was clicking, but you, was not, you wasn't clicking. You had the impression to, and this is kind of disturbing. Because it means they, they play with your mind, they make you feel you click. Believe me, this is not a click uh, for anybody clicking on this guy. I, I turn it off and you're going to be like, oh, doesn't click anymore. Yeah, it totally tricks me. So that, that was like, I, I had to like, you know, I sat there like at the store, you know, like going like this and like, no, it's not <laughs> actually moving down. <laughs> and it's just, it, yeah. So if, if you haven't tried it, you know, go to the next Apple store yeah. when you have time and, you know, just try it. Well, if you, tr it's a fun if you want to try to ours uh, from Uli and, and me after the panel, uh, well, feel free. Don't break my, 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 my beloved. All right, let's move to the last. Uh, precious. Um, precious. Okay. I would just like to add something. I really do think there's a big future in all these haptic engines, but let's look out of the box a little bit. Let's not focus this on keyboards and mouses. Let's take it to the next level. I read this article, for example, where you would have a jacket or a shirt filled with taptic engines. So what, what does that mean? If you wear that Who's in an airplane... Who's going to clean the suits? Yeah. yeah, you could actually feel what's going on in the plane. You would recognize this information through the oh, taptic plane. engines. Is that what they call it today? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> these, kind, these kind of clothes exist, in fact. I know. It, it was uh, released um, last year, I think, in Roland Garros uh, tournament in France. It was made by, uh, I think it's a uh, it's, uh, twin, it was something like a partnership between uh, IBM and Decathlon, which is a French manufacturer. <coughs> and uh, they, no, it's, well, it's, it's full of captors of, of uh, we measure how we, how we sweat, it measures the, it's a uh, step tracker, it's a calories burner tracker, it's something else, but the fact that you have to wear a little box in it. And okay, but where would you put the chip, the controllers, this kind of stuff, if you build? I still well. think this is in development, so there's maybe just <laughs> another way to go when you combine this with like virtual rea reality systems, which we have now, you could have a completely virtual world and actually feel it at the same time. So this is something that's probably coming quite soon. Well, and that there, there already are a bunch of um, um, mechanisms that were dev developed where you can essentially stitch like circuits at least. I'm not sure if they're at the level of chips yet, but they have some slightly flexible chips at least. So I would think 
you know, like if you look at the plastic on your zipper, like on your jacket or something, yeah. it's fairly rigid, and you'd probably get an area like that in which you could put fairly decent electronics. Are you guys familiar with the Arduino lily pad? So uh, that's exactly it. It's Arduino, but designed to be sewn onto clothing. So it's, it's some of them are, the big ones are flexible, and the smaller ones are just really small. So, and it's got conductive thread and stuff. So really cool thing to do with your kids, Arduino and Lilypad. All right, let's move to the next thing, because I, I also wanted to have you guys discuss on that subject, which we also got last year, um, um, Swift. And uh, interesting part is that almost all WWF sessions this year use it, except for the Sprite Kids folks, they are re uh, rebels. They still stick on Objective-C. And um, so, um, yeah, um, so I wanted to have a discussion about that. And bye-bye to all the people leaving. They have to catch whatever trains and flying and whatever, which I understand. If anybody's watching the videos, don't be afraid that the room is empty now. It's because it's late. And uh, watch the other videos. It wasn't always uh, that empty. Um, so Swift, as a last uh, comment. So what's, uh, how big is your excitement? Or uh, what do you think Apple is having a hard time on it? I think not? Swift being open source is a huge deal. I hope Apple will do a good stewardship of it uh, and uh, not let it scatter in a thousand different branches that are becoming compatible. Um, I also think that if you're doing new development, new app development right now, it would be foolish to not start it in Swift, at least for the experience, but it's stable enough to do that, and it's, it's clearly the way that Apple wants us to go. So if you're maintaining an app, I don't see a whole lot of usefulness in, in mixing and matching, but definitely if you're starting something new and you're thinking about how much I'm going to charge for it, just write it in Swift. And rewrite it next year. And rewrite it again the year after that. No, no, you don't have to rewrite. Well, you just rewrite. You select the menu item, translate to Swift 3. <laughs> or Swift it's not rewrite. Okay. Like I spent, I spent. To be honest, I spent about a day uh, for uh, to go to Swift one two, and and that's re that's kind of reasonable. It's not a week. To make a back reference to my talk today, um, I talked about how Objective C had its <laughs> greatest strength was the C, and its greatest weakness was the C, and I think that's what. Swift has, in Swift, they took the language and took out the C. Yep, and, and that will be, I think that will be something we'll benefit from alone in code quality for decades. Yeah. My personal opinion about this is rather skewed because I do mail plugins and I need the, I need the runtime in order to swizzle and, and do what I do. So uh, that's not possible right now in Swift. Who knows if they won't write uh, some runtime parts to Swift to make it possible. Um, I doubt it, but it's, it's possible. I think Swift is really, really focused uh, for the uh, iOS environment. Um, and I think going forward on iOS, yeah, for, for, the, the, for the other two platforms besides OS X, I think, I think it's, it's, uh, it's way more uh, viable on that. There's a lot of stuff they cannot do with what Swift is right now. They cannot do on Mac OS. You can't do bindings. Yeah, it's true. You They're can't do key value coding. I don't yeah. know how. I don't. There's no. I'm. I'm kind of confused how a lot of stuff works uh, if you're using Swift and you need key value coding because. Yeah. I mean that all uses swizzling. How does it work? Yeah. So. They've they've also added like special syntactic sugar just to make core data work in Swift. There's no generic mechanism for that. Those very and dynamic aspects are, yeah. are difficult to do in Swift and right now. I don't, uh, well, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't really think that they will reintroduce a lot of this dynamism again. Yeah. Because I, I don't, I don't the way so it is structured, it seems, you know, like when, when we old carbon farts um, were forced to go to Objective-C, <laughs> One of the things that happened was that many of us went and went like, well, those Objective-C people, you know, with all their runtime information, they're essentially shipping their source code. And that's kind and of And their crash was because it's dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> well, but no, but, but it's, it's this, um, you have so much information in there. And of course, with all the stuff Apple does right now, they're kind of, I think they're kind of getting interested in being able to hide more of their code from people like us who will, you know, class dump stuff and find out how to work around some things. So um, I can totally see that, um, I, I, told, I, I 
like just how Swift looks, I think it is intended to allow you to hide your code and Apple will probably make use of that. So I think, I don't know, find a new project, have fun. Yeah, exactly, it's, a very, it's an interesting language and uh, you know, I plan to, to, to look at it to, to maybe go forward and do something different. You can tell that, that though that uh, if you're doing Mac development, uh, if it's an app that could go on the App Store, like it doesn't have to, but if it's an app that could go on the App Store and play with the sandbox and stuff, Swift is probably really well suited for that. Yeah. But if you're doing an app that, do, that does more, like a, it, it, it has to go out of the sandbox, it has to do all these things, then uh, you're going to have a harder time, in my impression. You, so you can see where, which way Apple is going. They want you to write, a, write Mac App Store apps, not utilities that you know, do disk repair or something. Well, I would like to add that uh, in, there are some examples that I still think they will have to add to Swift, at least some part of the runtime. One example for that is uh, serialization. To actually write a useful serialization system, you, would have to, you need to have some runtime information or you would have to write completely all the code yourself, which is not the best case always. So. All right, we're going to wrap this up because we have to slowly come to an end. Um, oh. 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 <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, thank you everybody for being there. Thank you, those guys. <laughs> thanks to the speakers. Uh, thanks to everybody. And again, we will uh, stay around for a few minutes here. And uh, we will meet later if everybody is still uh, in town, probably around 8 p.m. Um, just keep it notch here. And uh, yeah, see you maybe next year. Who knows? Maybe in two years. Who knows? Maybe never. Who knows? We'll ask the Phoenix. That's it. Thank you.